This doesn't tell us how much work gravity is doing, by the way. It tells us how much work we have to do to fight gravity. We have to do six joules of work to fight gravity and move from here to here, or two joules of work to fight gravity and move from here to here. Gravity is doing the opposite work. So when we move from here to here, gravity must be doing negative six joules of work. You can kind of see that because the object's moving up, but gravity is pulling down. We know that when the force is opposite to the motion, we would get negative work. So to move from here to here, gravity would have been doing negative six joules of work because it's opposing the motion. Remember that when a force is in the direction of motion, it's doing positive work. And when the force is opposing motion, it's doing negative work. I'm going to write that as a formula here. The work that's done by a conservative force is the negative of the change in potential energy. The work that's done by a conservative force is the negative of the change in potential energy. People can get kind of confused by this negative sign, but we kind of explain why that makes sense here. For example, suppose that you're moving the object from the ground to here. Well, we know that gravity is opposing you. Gravity is moving opposite to the motion, so it makes sense that it should be negative. Um, so here, the change in energy was positive six joules, but gravity was doing negative six joules of work. Or if you move from here to here, the po potential energy increased by positive two joules, but gravity must have been doing negative two joules of work to oppose that. The person that moved this must have been doing po uh, positive two joules of work because they're pushing in the direction of motion. Something to keep in mind about potential energy is you can choose any point you want to be the ground. You should choose whatever point is convenient. For example, if I was doing a problem here, I would probably choose the floor here to be the ground. Right? I would probably choose the floor to be the ground, but that's just arbitrary because after all, we're on like the second floor. Right? If I wanted to, I could use the surface of the earth outside as the ground. So what you choose as the ground is arbitrary. If you wanted to, for example, you could choose this as the ground. You could say that this was a height of zero. Well, if this was at a height of zero, then the potential energy of this object would be zero. The potential energy of this object would be two. And the potential energy of this object would be negative six joules, because it's uh, below the height. You can see that usually you want to pick the ground to be the lowest point in the problem, so that you don't get negative energies. But there's nothing paradoxical about having a negative energy. Uh, remember that everything wants to lower its energy. So something with a negative energy is just really happy. Things want to get as negative an energy as possible. But usually you would pick this as zero height, because then you won't have any negative energies. But that's one thing you have to do when you're solving problems. Choose where the height is going to be zero. Just like you get to choose your axes, you get to choose where the height is going to be zero. So how would you change, figure out the change in potential energy? Suppose that you're changing your height. How would we adapt this formula to tell you the change in the potential energy? Okay. or mg delta h. These two things are constants. <coughs> so this would just um, be mg delta h. Remember that what we usually care about is the change in energy. So this is a formula that you might have to use a lot. mg times delta h. about ready to start trying some problems. Remember that this was our general formula for work. Um, work tells you the change in the kinetic energy. So to make this a little bit clearer, this is what's called the work energy theorem. This is called the work energy theorem. If you take all the work done by all the forces on an object, that will tell you the change in the kinetic energy. If you add up all the work by all the forces, that will tell you the change in the kinetic energy. This is the work energy theorem. If you take all the work done by all the forces and add them up with the right signs, that will tell you the total change in kinetic energy.
But there's two types of work, remember? There's the work that's done by the non-conservative forces, and there's the work that's done by the conservative forces. So this would be the same equation. Instead of saying the work done by all the forces, you can split that up into non-conservative and conservative. So if we add all the work that's done, that'll tell you the change in energy. But remember, how do you figure out the work that's done by conservative forces? In fact, you can kind of think of that, that's the whole purpose of calculating potential energies. They're just a shortcut for calculating the work that's done by the conservative forces. Potential energies are just a shortcut that gives us a quick and easy way to figure out the work that's being done by the conservative forces. Now what happens if we solve this for the work that's done by the non-conservative forces? We would get this equation. This is the key equation we'll be using for solving problems. Can you see how we could go from this equation to here? We just added delta u to both sides. The work that's done by the non-conservative forces tells you the change in potential energy plus the change in kinetic energy. This is going to be like our Newton's second law. This will be our general framework for solving lots of problems. Sometimes people wonder why they can just ignore the conservative forces. Well, we're not ignoring them. They've already been taken into account with this change in potential energy. That's already taken into account, the work that's done by the conservative forces. So notice that potential energy plus kinetic energy, that's what we call mechanical energy. The total mechanical energy is the kinetic plus the potential. Kinetic plus potential is called the mechanical energy. Remember your instructor also mentioned thermal energy? Well, thermal energy is not considered mechanical energy. That's one reason we're not going to focus on it too much. The key part types of energy we're going to focus on this term are kinetic and potential. So to put those in one category, they're called mechanical energy. So here's the key formula that we're going to use for solving problems again. The net work that's done by the non-conservative forces equals the change in the mechanical energy. The net work by the non-conservative forces equals the change in the mechanical energy. The work energy theorem tells us about the work that's done by all the forces, but that's not really very useful for solving problems. For solving problems, we're going to use this equation. The net work by the non-conservative forces equals the change in the potential energy. I'm sorry, equals the change in the mechanical energy. All right, let's try to do some problems.